Good morning, everyone. This is the fourth lecture of the series and uh, will be led by Denis Karati. So the lecture is on uh, modern topics in uh, non-perturbative QFT on a very general ground, like uh, Hamiltonian truncation as matrix bootstrap and so on and so forth. And we have the pleasure to have it given by Denis Karati. So Denis uh, started his career at CISA with a PhD and then went working with uh, Peredon at PFL on these topics, even if in a more probably conformal bootstrap setup and later closer to what he's doing now. And now he's active in his very recent work on these techniques. So it is a pleasure to have them uh, explained by him. The format of the lecture will be the following. So we'll have a first tranche of uh, 45, 50 minutes, then a small break where you're allowed to ask questions and discuss uh, for 10, 15 minutes, depending on uh, the length of the discussion. And we will continue with a second branch with the same format. The lecture, because of me and Dennis, uh, will uh, stop more or less at uh, 12 and 30. So from 12, so it's 12. till uh, 12 and 30, there is a space for discussion. Someone was asking something or heard the... No, sorry. I was, hearing, I was hearing something, maybe I thought it was a question. So this is more or less the format. So Dennis, there's a hole for my side and uh, I let you speak. Let's start this uh, lecture. All right. Hello. Thank you, Davide. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it would have been really a pleasure to, to meet everyone in person. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's good enough like that. Thank you, Davide, for inviting me. And, uh, and I will try today to basically, sorry, uh, maybe it's Nirai Kumar, we can hear some, some sometimes the sound. Huh. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, basically it, the, the lectures I will give in this uh, two days, there will be a little bit uh, improvisation about various topics. And uh, I would like just to give an overview of, well, of non-perturbative quantum field theories and what we can do. And this will be based on my personal understanding of various projects, little projects I did. And uh, I will try to keep the discussion schematic and if you want to get into the details, ask some further questions or talk about current open problems, I'm happy to discuss after the lectures or even offline. Anyway, so today there will be day first. I thought I will try to talk about uh, uh, the non perturbative definition. Uh, definition of quantum field theories. Um, I'll consider a couple of examples. Then I will discuss what actually we would like to compute in quantum field theories, basically the observables. Then I will discuss what techniques we have. To do that and i will present some some results some results so uh, in the during the first day i will a couple of times mention conformal field theories they they are an important part of a non perturbative uh, qft definition but i will try to move all the aspects which are connected to conformal field theories today too. So basically, I will talk about uh, how to define define conformal field theories (CFTs). Um, consider a couple of examples. Briefly discuss the method, numerical method we have. and um, interesting directions. So this part, I want to, to keep it relatively short. Well, relatively short, so maybe 25% of the lectures. And uh, so day first, uh, day, day one will be probably 
there's too much information. So some of, some of this information will, might migrate to day two, but let's see how it goes. Okay. And uh, please, well, let, let me, please uh, let's keep the discussion open. Feel free to ask uh, any questions at any time. Very well. So let's start with a non-perturbative definition of quantum field theories. So suppose I have an energy scale. It starts from zero. Energy. So what we would like to do, we would like to take some simple, well, some well-defined model at very high energies. So the, strictly speaking at infinite energies. And, uh, and this theory has, uh, we assume that it has, well, it has uh, scale invariance, but it also has conformal invariance. We assume that. And basically this part will be described by the CFT, conformal field theory. And uh, I will, since it's high energies, I will denote it by UV. UV means high energy. So if we deform the CFT by a set of relevant operators, I will talk about it more concretely tomorrow. Here, I just wanna be very schematic, plus the deformation. This starts an RG flow uh, to, to zero energy, okay? And generically, uh, we arrive to another conformal field theory, but now at uh, extremely low energies, so I'll call it IR. So this whole construction, I would refer to as the quantum field theory, is the modern uh, definition of the quantum field theory. And the goal here is, let me use another, uh, another color. So the goal here, given this data, given the CFT data and the deformation, compute uh, compute all observables. Uh, observables at any energy scale. And generic observables, which exist in any quantum field theories, are correlation functions. Okay, in a moment we'll define a little more observables, but uh, generically they are correlation functions. Uh, right, so here's the goal. Let's uh, consider a couple of examples. Ah, yeah, and uh, let, let, me, let me tell you that this definition is, is called the um, UV, so the QFT is defined this way, they're called UV complete, UV complete. So uh, UV complete stands for the fact that if you compute some correlation functions along the uh, flow, if you take energies to infinity, we'll still have some well-defined observables. They will basically be given by correlation functions of the conformal field theory. All right, so let's uh, discuss examples. So let me start with uh, the simplest one, I guess, the phi to the four theory. So the Lagrangian of the phi to the four theory is given uh, by the following expression. So this is my kinetic term. Phi is the scalar field. And this is the potential, which is defined the following way. There's a message. Right, very good. Uh, thank you for the question. 
Uh, so uh, in practice, uh, so the conformal field theory has some relevant uh, some some relevant operators. Relevant operators meaning that the scaling dimensions are less than the space-time dimension. So then the uh, the action, which I will call, let me call it action, of the QFT is uh, will be given by the action of the UV CFT. plus the action of the deformation. And the deformation is, uh, sorry, yeah. You basically take some relevant operator of uh, inside your CFT in position space, then you integrate over the space time. Well, it's not D4X and I'm, I'm, I wanna leave in general dimensions. Okay. And now uh, the deformation, so uh, Q CFTs, they don't have any energy scale. So now the deformation breaks that. So now we introduce explicitly the energy scale and uh, let me call it M. It will kick at some point. And then you need to uh, take uh, this, uh, the powers of M in such a way to compensate. Well, basically we, need, we want to keep the action dimensionless. So the dimension of this thing will be uh, delta, uh, delta minus four minus D, right? So, so this power of M should be uh, D plus delta. And there will be some coupling constant, let's call it G. Right, so that's what I mean by the deformation. In general, if you have multiple, uh, multiple, um, multiple uh, relevant operators in your conformal field theories, they can come in at different scales with various couplings. Good. So that is completely generic, and if if we look at the example now, it should be also clear from the example. So uh, here's the phi to the four theory. Here's the kinetic term, and here's the potential. Plus, it's um, Excellent. So here's the phi to the four theory. And um, well, let's call it red. So this part is a free massless boson. So uh, it gives you a CFT. It's a free boson CFT, free bosonic. And in principle, we know everything about this theory. And uh, we can, can compute any correlation functions in principle, though it can be difficult in some cases. Right? And this potential, that's what I would refer as the deformation. Here, M0 is, the, is some mass-like parameter mass like parameter which you can could call a bare mass and uh, lambda is the coupling one can i, I don't want to talk about uh, counter terms but they are picked in such a way to remove all your divergences and make m0 and lambda bar finite so they m0 and lambda bar they're really your uh, parameters, bare parameters, finite parameters in the UV. So this free bosonic CFT and the, the deformations triggered breaks the conformal symmetry, conformal symmetry explicitly because of this mass scale. And then it starts the RG flow and you arrive to, well, and then you can start computing observables at any RG scale. 
Uh, here I pulled out explicitly the mass parameter. So lambda bar is dimensionless. Okay. So another another example. Ah, yeah. L let let me let me uh, stress that this is a UV complete theory in uh, in d uh, greater or equal than two and less than four. Okay. What happens with the phi to the four theory in four dimensions? Well, it is not UV complete anymore. So the phi to the four theory in four dimensions can be seen as an effective field theory. Uh, there are various ways to see it, like in, in, in a perturbative language. Uh, one can talk about Landau singularities, Landau poles. Landau pole. There are also some indications from the lattice now that this is uh, this holds uh, this holds uh, non-perturbatively this statement. So basically, your phi to the four theory is defined at some energy scale uh, here. And it will be valid up to some uh, some cutoff e, but because it's renormalizable, you don't know where this cutoff is. Okay, let me remove this. Excellent. Um, so this is phi to the four theory. Let me just uh, write a couple of more examples here. Uh, so in B is the Ising. Ising field theory in uh, 2D or 3D. So Ising uh, field theory is basically when you have the uh, 2D Ising CFT in the UV. Such a CFT has two parameters, uh, two relevant operators, sorry, sigma and epsilon, and then you can use it to to construct various deformation deformations of the uh, 2D or 3D CFT. So it's uh, uh, the, this topic gains popularity now. Uh, and C just uh, let's to, we, we cannot skip it. Uh, let's take uh, 4D um, QCD quantum chromodynamics. So it's a gauge theory in the UV. In the extreme UV, it's a free theory. Well, and no, we know that it confines, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so these examples of UV complete theories. I should mention that, um, let me put it in the new slide, uh, two examples of non-UV complete theories. One we already mentioned is uh, d equal four phi to the four theory. And another one is uh, d equal four uh, quantum electrodynamics. It also has a Landau pole, and it's not uh, strictly speaking well defined at extremely, at infinitely high energies. Excellent. Uh, so now I would like to move to various non-perturbative observables in quantum field theories. But if you have some questions about what I just said, uh, please uh, feel free to ask. Uh, hi, um, are Landau poles the like uh, the unique sort of uh, definition of what it means to be a non-UV complete theory, or there are uh, other indicators also? Um, good. So basically, um, schematically speaking, any observable you could compute in your QFT, uh, uh, let's say observable, and uh, at, uh, let's say, which depends on the distance. Uh, for, for example, very concretely speaking, if you take uh, 
like a two point function of x or of zero, where O is some local operator. Uh, and let's say I'm in Euclidean space, Euclidean. Um, anyway, Euclidean space. So if you compute that, you should be able, uh, this will be some function of X. If you compute, uh, if, if you take now the limit, X goes to zero, it's meaning, meaning energy to infinity, energy scale to infinity. Uh, you, you, what in the, in a UV complete theory, you will see that F in the limit X goes to zero, this will be some constant, right? This is in the UV complete theory, but if it's a non-UV complete theory, in general, you, you will have, well, some divergence infinity. What happens with Landau poles? Uh, very schematically. So that is how, well, you, you see in non perturbative field theories, it's very hard to compute the correlation functions and talk about them. So we don't talk about them very often. But uh, what uh, Landau, his argument, uh, you, for instance, you can, you, can, you, can, you can compute a scattering amplitude. Scattering amplitudes. And then use a Born approximation to get potentials classical, semi-classical potentials, semi-classical uh, potentials. And then you can uh, see what happens at uh, very, at, at small distances. And you will see that this potential will diverge. And this, uh, for example, is explained in Peskin Schroeder. Uh, it's, it's probably formulated in a different way, but it's uh, the computation is done in, in section six or seven in Pascal and Schroeder. Um, yeah, uh, thanks. So I have a question on this example now. So did I understand you correct that F of zero would be constant or in this limit when we take X to zero? Exactly, exactly. But isn't this, typically divergent because the operator product is not well defined, right? In one space time point. And that's like the whole point of the operator product expansion of that. Or... So uh, good. In, uh, in conformal field theory, the operator product expansion between, so they, yeah, just for everyone, uh, the, the operator product expansion, if you take uh, two operators, uh, let me call them. Uh, yeah, let me call them operator A of X and some B of Y. In conformal field theories, you can write it as a sum of uh, all possible operators in your theory. Uh, let's say X times some function which depends on, on X, Y, and derivatives uh, acting on all possible operators. And uh, this, uh, the, you can rewrite two operators as an infinite sum of all possible uh, operators, but one operator here. And uh, this thing is is uh, is valid for a finite di distance x minus y. In uh, generic, when when we don't have conformal uh, invariance, this is not true. And uh, the operator product expansion holds only at finite at, at, at the infinitesimal distance when x is very close to y. However, I don't want to talk about operator product expansion in this case. I would simply want to take a, a two-point function. So this two-point function, and uh, in Euclidean space, it's uh, well you can call it time ordered regarding with Euclidean time. So this thing is a well-defined object. And uh, so you can compute it at any energy scales. And as an application of this statement, one can uh, very simply derive, for example, the C theorem, C theorem uh, in, uh, in 2D. So uh, very roughly what is happening, if you take a generic correlation function in, in your in your QFT, where you have the stress tensor now, T mu nu of X, 
uh, t rho sigma of zero. And this is a Euclidean two point function. I'll put Euclidean or time ordered with respect to Euclidean time. If you, if you send this, the x to zero, this is uv, and you have to recover uv CFT. In the uv CFT, this two point function is fixed and it is given basically by some tensor structure and the central charge CT, CT in the UV. And then if you go to IR, uh, IR means uh, X to infinity, then you recover IR CFT. And you should, uh, you should get, you should probe the central charge in, in the IR. So this two point function is a function of, well, it is, um, as, I, as I said above, it's a function of f of x. You can also rewrite it in terms of the spectral density uh, of some energy, spectral density rho at some energy scale. And you will see that this spectral density probes the UV central charge and IR central charge in the limits. Anyway, I can give more details, but uh, basically, I'm trying to, to, to convince you that this is a well-defined object, this uh, two-point function, and uh, it should be constant in the UV or IR. And one of the applications is the CTRM in two dimensions. You can use this language to derive it. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Let's uh, go to the observables. Um, well, for, for consistency, let me switch to back to, to, to black. So observables. in QFTs. Right, so generic observables, as I, as I mentioned, the way I understand are correlation functions. And uh, let me just pause a second on what kind of correlation functions we can have. So in Euclidean space, we can have uh, well, there is basically a unique correlation function. It's a Euclidean correlation function or time ordered correlation function with respect to Euclidean time. So it's uh, one of x, x1, x2, etc. And uh, I'll put E to distinguish it from, from anything else. Uh, so this is Euclidean space. In the Lorentzian space, one, have, one has many, many more options. Well, the basic object is the Whiteman correlation function. And uh, I'll denote it, uh, I'll, I'll put an index W here to, to, to denote, uh, to, to remind that it's the Whiteman. What happens basically in, in, in when we take the limit when x one the position of operator one and two are very close at the at coincident points this object is not well defined the correlation function is is in general is not well defined and uh, Whiteman two point functions uh, they introduce the regulator if you take for for example the coordinate x x1 mu, I'll take first the time component, x1 zero, and the time component has a small i epsilon part. And the space part is just, it's, it's, uh, 
it's untouched. This epsilon is a real, the real parameter. It's very small, but it's greater than zero. When you have such a regulator, you can uh, do whatever you want with this uh, Whiteman functions. You can take integrals, and uh, when two operators are coinciding, these integrals will be well defined because of this epsilon. And at the end of the computation, you take epsilon to zero, and uh, you recover. Well, you get some finite, well defined answer. So generically, Whiteman functions in Lorentz and space is the thing we would like to to work with. They are very well defined. Unfortunately, for example, in perturbation theory, they are not uh, that easily accessible. And in perturbation theory, what we normally uh, recover are the uh, time order two point functions. So let me denote them. Let me just write two operators for, for simplicity. Uh, and anything, is, anything I say should be applicable to three or higher point functions. So the time order, well, normally you put the time order in symbol here, I'll put it here. Sorry for not being obeying the classical convention. Anyway, the time, time ordered two point function can be written as a sum of two Whiteman two point functions. So basically, this is the step function x10 minus x20. Right, plus the other part. When, uh, when time of the second operator is bigger than the time of the first operator, we'll put this theta function. And now we switch the position of two operators. Good. So in the Whiteman two-point function, the order of two operators is very important because uh, the first operator is regulated with uh, minus i epsilon. So you cannot just flip the order. The order is important. Instead, by construction, the time ordered two-point function is, uh, yeah, is uh, invariant under the exchange of two operators. So we like very much two-point function in perturbation theory. The problem with these uh, objects is that when x1 is equal to x2, generically uh, time order two point functions or higher point functions. They're not well defined and you need to introduce the contact terms uh, to make them, yeah, to make them uh, good, good objects. And this, uh, this uh, contact terms in many cases involve some arbitrariness. Okay, let me see the question. Very good. Uh, yes, I assumed here that the operators are all bosonic. If uh, you have uh, fermions, then you have to put a minus sign here. Yeah, thank you. Right, so one can also introduce some, some other correlation functions like uh, uh, retarded or advanced. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we work less with these objects. Good. So these are, these are the first class of observables. However, there are special situations. There are some spe there is a special class of quantum field theories where you can define more observables. So, so well, let me just schematically maybe draw like this. So this is the space of all possible QFTs. And uh, here I will, uh, there the are QFTs with particles. Yeah. Uh, QFTs uh, with particles. Let me explain what I mean. So, uh, let me go back to the to, to my picture. So this is my UV CFT plus the deformation. 
And um, so UVCFT plus the deformation starts the RG flow. And at some point, suppose my theory has, has a particle with mass M. And after that, well, the theory is empty. So here, this is the mass gap. And here in the, in the previous picture, in the very generic case, I, I, I drew IRCFT. And what happens basically, if, if there's a particle and there, there are no, no other objects at low energies, just a particle with mass M. So if you go at energy scales below the mass, there's nothing. So your QFT is empty. So in this particular class, uh, the IRCFT is empty. And um, what I would like to say that at low energies, some quantum field theories, they, uh, their natural language can be reformulated in terms of uh, scattering of particles here. Uh, so formally, the way you you uh, you think well, the, let's say the way I think about particles uh, in the in the UVCFT, I have or yeah, UVCFT and the deformation are the degrees of freedom or the language, which is uh, convenient to describe quantum theory at very high energies. But when you go to low energies, there is a different language which is more convenient, and uh, this language is uh, formulated in terms of asymptotic states. Asymptotic. In and out states. So I can de denote them like, I'll denote them N particle, particle states, and they can be either in or out right and um, so i don't want to define them formally it's a little bit nasty business but uh, just conceptually when when you have some interaction which can be which dies out quickly at long distances you can have some state which behaves like uh, one particle uh, and it's not interacting with anything else. So you can think about the pion, for example, or a proton. And, uh, or you, you can have a two, two, two particle system. So at very large distances, they behave like non-interacting states. Um, but then if you bring two particles, well, well you have, if you have uh, two particles close to each other, then uh, the interaction kicks in and you get a strong process. And that, what we, we say, for, for example, when we have a particle one comes from somewhere, particle one and particle two, and we scatter them. And, and, and this is the, this system is described by two particle state incoming. And when the scattering happened, you get, uh, uh, two particles out, and this system will be described by two particles out. And what uh, we, we often do in Pesky and Schroeder, we bypass very quickly correlation functions, and instead we focus on objects with particles, and then we study objects, uh, the, the scattering amplitudes, which we can define as STU. times some delta function due to conservation of momenta. Uh, two particle state out, two particle state in. Right. The 
LSD formula provides the connection between the scattering amplitude, LSD formula, provides the connection between the scattering amplitude and the four point function, time ordered four point function. The LSD reduction formula. And I still actually still would like to read the original uh, LSZ paper, but it's in German. It's crazy. And uh, there's no official translation as far as I know. Anyway, it's a side comment. Um, anyway, so uh, you can think four point functions, uh, time order two point functions are very complicated beasts. But uh, if you have particles, you can you can think, or I, the way I think, you can I think that scattering amplitude is some simplified or reduced four point function. And it is an easier object to work with. Very good. Excellent. So this is the sketch amplitude of particles, and there is um, there is an intermediate object uh, called uh, the form factor. David. How much time do I have? It's 42 minutes. Should we go five more minutes? I think you can go. Yeah, I think you can go to the time you think it's the time to stop in the sense that uh, we have no pressure to stop at 45 or 50, as you wish. I mean, just uh, taking into account that we, at some point it would be nice to have a break. Exactly. I'll, I'll just finish the observables and then I think we'll, we'll You can go as you prefer. Mm -hmm. So uh, let, let me just summarize what I said observables so the first one apart from correlation function we introduce scattering amplitudes um, and another object is the form factor The form factor is defined as a two particle state out some local operator at uh, position x zero and the vacuum. And of course you, you can have n particle states if you want here. So the, the, the two, two two particles, they will have momenta P1 and P2. And so this object will be a function, let me call it a form factor. This will be a function, O stands for the local operator and will be a function of S, where S is defined as minus P1, plus P2 squared. Uh, so this is a scalar object. I assume that the operator O is a scalar, bosonic, uh, bosonic scalar operator. Then this, this uh, matrix element should be scale invariant, uh, sorry, scale invariant, uh, Lorentz invariant. So uh, the only thing we can write here is a scalar function. And it should be a Lorentz invariant combination of uh, two momenta, P1 and P2, and the only object you can write is this. Well, you can also write another object, uh, which is, you can call it T in this case, P1 minus P2, but this <clears throat> T will be related to S, if I remember correctly. It's, if I don't screw up the, the signs, it's S minus T M squared. So basically there's a scalar function, which depends only on one variable. These kind of matrix elements are called the form factors. And uh, they are sort of a, a something in between, between the scattering amplitude, because they have uh, asymptotic states here, and uh, in between uh, scattering amplitudes and correlation functions, because they also, they mix both the correlation function and the asymptotic states. 
uh, good. And then uh, let me just focus on one more observable. So this was Sketry amplitude. The Sketry amplitude is defined as TU. STU, and in this constant context, we have, I re yeah, let me just to be very precise. So when I have sketch amplitudes, I sketch our particles with momenta P1, uh, P2, I think I, I was not very precise here, P3, P4. Okay, and here there are two particle states uh, with P1 and P2 momenta. When I talk about particles, or particle states, particles, They're described by the momentum P1 mu, where mu goes from zero to uh, D minus one. So it's uh, P1 zero, P1. And the particle means that there's an, uh, an well, you can, the, the following constraint P1 squared is equal to the mass. So this is normally what we call as on-shell constraint. So basically the energy of the particle, well, this is just the standard things, m squared plus P, P1. Okay. So particles are these particular objects which obey uh, this constraint. Good, sketch amplitudes, form factors. And uh, one third object I would like to talk about is the Fourier transform. Fourier trans uh, transform of the Whiteman two point function of the stress tensor. So if you take the uh, Fourier transform um, and you study the carefully <clears throat> the little group structure of this correlator, you we will see that there is a there are two spectral two functions which are called spectral densities. They're called spectral densities, and there is a little group spin one. Uh, spectral density. T stands for the stress tensor, and uh, I'll put zero here for spin zero, and it depends on S, where is the parameter of the Fourier transform. And I have little group uh, spin two of S. And uh, regarding the, 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 the question I had uh, had previously, so these kind of functions, they, right. So if, if I take S to zero or infinity, they remain finite in these limits and they will prop your central charges in the EV CFT and in the IR CFT. The same thing is true here. If you send S, here to zero or infinity of the form factor. This is a finite function. It will, and the same is true for the sketch amplitude. If your sketch amplitude comes from a UV complete theory at very high energies, it will be completely finite, unitary, well-defined. Right, so uh, I, I propose, I will stop here. Uh, and, and we finish the first part here. In the second part, what I will do is to first talk about some particular methods which allow to compute these observables, starting from the UV definition. And I will show you some plots very concretely what you can do. So these are not just the abstract, abstract things, you can actually compute them numerically. 
And then I will talk about bootstrap methods, how you can put generic constraints on these particular objects from generic principles. Okay, that will be the second part of the talk today. Okay, so I mean, we can start discussing any questions for the one who want to stay here in the Zoom room, for the others we can meet in uh, 10, 15 minutes, depending on the discussion. Let's say 11, just uh, tentatively in case we can uh, discuss for five minutes more and then start again. Okay, now then it's just to start with a question. I have a, um, a very naive inside the question on what you were saying about the mandelstam standard invariance here in the four factors and also in the scattering amplitude. So you're saying that there are, uh, in the four factor there are unit two, but the four factor is already depending on S because one is de depends on the other. Now, can you expand more on this in the sense that I think that uh, you, you need, um, that uh, you, you have three in four dimension and that momentum conservation is uh, uh, allowing you to eliminate one. But maybe, maybe, I'm wrong. Um, maybe there is more assumption. Good, good, good. Let, let me repeat. Um, yeah, let, let's open the new, new chapter. Yeah, I was not uh, very, very precise here. Let's uh, be very precise. Um, so suppose I have scattering of, uh, of so suppose I have one particle, just one type of particle. So I have particle with mass M. And what I would like to do, I would like to scatter uh, two particles together. So two particles with mass M go here. Right. So th th this is sch schem schematic uh, drawing. Is uh, this particle has momentum p one, special momentum p two, and then uh, they scatter, and I get p three, special momentum p four. Okay, and uh, since I have only one type of particle, the following constraint holds. P1 squared is equal to minus M squared. And here I work in uh, a mostly plus signature. Mostly plus signature. Oh, namely, it, I mean, so it's a Lorentzian space. Every time I talk about uh, sketching amplitudes, I mean Lorentzian space. Here's my metric and it's minus, uh, plus, plus, etc., plus, depending on the number of dimensions. Okay, mostly plus. So this P1 squared is um, minus P1 zero squared plus pi special part squared all right so basically you have the scattering and you have of particles and each particle obeys this constraint in in d dimensions so what you would like to do to write the scattering amplitude it, it, the scattering amplitude depends on four momenta p1 p2 p3 p4 and when i don't put, put any index i mean uh, full a space-time dimensional index so i can put mu here if you want so that's that is your scattering amplitude it depends on these quantities however since the scattering amplitude is, is defined as just an inner product of 2ps with 2ps uh, in out uh, the right hand side is a scalar object uh, it's a lorentz invariant object so you cannot have any indices so you you need and and on top of it it's a lorentz invariant object in fact, uh, Poincaré invariant. So in the left-hand side, you should construct something which is scalar and Lorentz invariant. So that's why you cannot have any indices. It's a function S of, yeah, of something. And this something, the most generic thing you can write is STU variables. And uh, they are defined as uh, P1 plus P2 squared 
uh, t is minus uh, p1 minus p3 squared and u is uh, minus p1 minus p4 squared. Uh, you cannot write anything else. And, ah, and, and uh, um, also this, uh, this matrix element, uh, it is true only when the moment is conserved. So there's also another condition, p1 plus p2 should be equal to p3 plus p4. This condition come fr comes from uh, translation invariance. So we use basically all the symmetries to say something, how the scattering amplitude looks like, right? And uh, you see this, this quantity is a scale invariance. Obviously the Lorentz invariance, uh, we, we like them. Well, because they're squared, there are no indices. But on top of it, because of this condition that, that the particles are on shell, or basically they obey this constraint, uh, you can show that S plus T plus U are not independent quantities, but they are related by this, this uh, standard relation. So in fact, then the scattering amplitude in generic dimensions is a function of only two variables. But we like to write STU because of the, yeah, some, some other arguments, because we like to discuss crossing symmetry and crossing symmetry is very simple. If you keep STU variables independent, and then keep in mind that they are actually not independent, but they are related by this constraint. Yeah, I see. And sorry, in uh, in the form factor, you still have both, right? In the form factor, uh, in uh, in in the form factor, you can write uh, S and T. So in the form factor, you can write S and T, and these are a little bit different S and T. You, you shouldn't confuse them with yeah, exactly. the So there are there the different T's, and they're defined uh, defined here. These are the two objects you can define following the, exactly the same logic. Uh, but uh, again, because of the uh, on shell condition, because of the partic particles obey this condition, uh, S and T are related. So they're not independent and you normally drop T. Mm -hmm. Well, not normally, you, you drop it. It's not, uh, it's not an independent function, uh, variable. Okay, I see. No, thank you. I was not familiar with the, these other SNTs, why I was a bit confused, but now it's clear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, could you uh, say again what row zero and row T, row two you have there, the spectral densities? Sure. So good. Uh, so uh, we usually assume that the our quantum field theory is uh, is um, Lorentz invariant or Poincaré invariant. Poincaré means uh, translational invariant and Lorentz invariant, and then the symmetry, the Lorentz symmetry is SO one. Uh, D minus one. Okay. So the operators, they transform under this Lorentz symmetry. And this indices mu nu rho sigma of the stress tensor, for example, uh, they, they transform uh, under this symmetry. However, when we discussed Hilbert space, Hilbert space, so basically, we, when we discuss states in our quantum field theories. So states in the quantum field theories, they are uh, transforming in the representation actually SOD minus one. And this is uh, this, if, if you have particles, and this is called the little group. So the little group. And uh, let me see if I can uh, just uh, give you a familiar example so it can click. I'll, I'll give you an example, familiar example, but uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, let me just finish uh, the, the logic, what I want to say. So you see this uh, two point function is, uh, is uh, transforming the Lorentz symmetry, but we would like actually to write everything in terms of the little group uh, representations. So we wanna decompose representations here of the Lorentz group into the little group representations. 
and this spin zero and spin two are the little group spins there are representations under this group s of d minus one little group spins so it's a reps of s of d minus one so weinberg discusses this uh, in a complicated way i think in section three um good now let me just uh, think of some some example mm. for, for example if you take um let's see if i can do it um If I take a gauge field, a mu, right? So this is the, let's say we're in four dimensions. So we work, let's say with quantum electrodynamics and uh, index mu goes from zero, it's zero, one, two, and three. Okay, of X. And uh, the way we write it is uh, we can write it as a Fourier transform D4 uh, D4P P dot X, and then the creation and annihilation operator. Uh, sorry, I'm screwed up. I did it. Pi over four. Uh, then we have probably momentum conservation, something like this, d four p squared, and then we have creation inhalation operators. A in fact, uh, lambda. So, and then we sum over uh, helicities. So you see our field is, uh, is, uh, is transforming in the Lorentz group. However, when, uh, what we would like to do, we would like to take the vacuum and then act with uh, creation and uh, annihilation operators uh, to construct particles. For example, uh, this uh, with, with momentum P should construct, uh, construct me a state with some momentum p and some helicity lambda. So lambda is a helicity. Right, so you see, this is my Hilbert space when I create states from the vacuum using creation annihilation operator, Hilbert space. And uh, these helicities is the they can be up and down for the uh, for this uh, spin zero particle and the little group for the spin uh, spin uh, sp sorry spin zero mass uh, zero is so2 right so that is my little group label however when i decompose the the field into creation inhalation operators i need some connection objects uh, which these connection objects which you can call polarizations they mixed they connect to representations, the uh, little group representation and the Lorentz group. Basically, this is example from the class, well, from, from the textbook and the similar, similar things uh, will, will, will be applied for any, any object, correlation function, any operator. Okay, thank you.
Right, if you want more details on that particular case, uh, on, on this particular case of the uh, stress tensor, how they decomposed, how to take the Fourier transform, how to do the little group decompositions, I can refer you to one of my papers. So I, I did uh, some section where I tried to do it pedagogically to learn it from myself, because I think it's not very well explained normally in the literature, though it should be a standard thing. Yeah, yes, please. Okay, so yeah, I think we could start again with the main flow of the lecture and I propose to postpone the rest of the questions if there are any at the end. So, Dennis, you can start again. I'm sorry you didn't have a break, but uh, oh, it's, it's fine. Okay. It's okay. Please. Okay, uh, please remind me to link the paper right after uh, after I finish the second part. And oh. Ah, thank you, Antonio. Fantastic. <laughs> All right, so what methods do so I define some non perturbative observables and uh, what methods do we have to actually compute them and uh, well the 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 the, the best well I, the most powerful and most uh, well developed method is, is lattice lattice so i'm not familiar uh, very much with lattice with, with all the details uh, but I'll just uh, mention it here. There is another, so it's it's very well developed and very powerful. The only drawback of the lattice is it's very expensive. Uh, by expensive, I mean uh, any calculation you want uh, takes a really, really long time on the cluster. And uh, well, it costs money. But yeah, I just recently talked uh, with a colleague uh, of mine and the numbers he set for running some simulations are crazy, absolutely crazy. But they can do whatever they want. Uh, the second method I would uh, call Hamiltonian truncation. And truncation. There are actually various uh, different variations of the Hamiltonian truncation, but I'll just, for simplicity, refer to them as a Hamiltonian truncation. It's just one direction. And um, the this method is uh, less developed, is less powerful, but it's uh, the, the benefit of it, it's inexpensive. So uh, in some cases, it works very well. In some cases, it doesn't. Uh, but when it works, it's uh, much uh, less expensive than, than the lattice. What this method methods allow you to do, so uh, let me tell you a concept, conceptual thing. So this method, they solve a particular model. Instead, there is another class of bootstrap uh, another class of methods. Uh, let me call them bootstrap. Bootstrap methods. So bootstrap methods are. Yeah, it's like a buzzword and uh, different people mean different things by, by bootstrap. So uh, let me give you my definition what I mean by bootstrap. So for me, bootstrap, anything, any method which uh, uses symmetries, uh, symmetries of the theory, uh, symmetries, and uh, 
fundamental and fundamental principles can be called a bootstrap. So bootstrap allows you to, to derive, uh, it allows you to derive, derive generic constraints. On the on the space of quantum field theories, of QFTs, and uh, from the definition you see, they are model independent. Model independent. All right. And you, you, can, uh, you can see already a, 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 a very big plus and a very big minus of bootstrap methods. So no matter what quantum field theory you have or conformal field theory, whatever, you can derive generic constraints or bounds or some statements, which are, well, true for any theory, perturbative, non-perturbative, everything will be applied. And when you do it, it's uh, why, why I like bootstrap methods personally is because you really have to go into, uh, uh, into fundamental properties of your theories and milk every single detail and be very careful with all the symmetries, what you, yeah, you get a generic understanding of what quantum field theory is. However, if you want to solve a particular model, you're a little bit screwed. Well, you are more in most cases screwed because well, you just get, I mean, a bound which and your allowed models they live inside and uh, i think an important direction which uh, should be taken in the future in whatever bootstrap methods uh, it's to link the uh, some numerical methods which solve particular models and generic bootstrap methods so you you basically can combine them In various ways, but there are um, unfortunately there are well not unfortunately there are only few works in this direction which uh, try to combine the two worlds, but I think it will be uh, yeah it will be important in the future. Now, what I would like to talk to you about uh, today in the rest of the talk are the bootstrap methods, uh, in particularly. The, so in the bootstrap method, let, let me say there's a S matrix bootstrap. And the, uh, inside S matrix bootstrap, again, there are various, uh, various methods which allow you to, to get uh, some results. And I just call them S matrix bootstrap um, you know, in, in, at, at one shot. Then there is numerical conformal bootstrap. Numerical conformal bootstrap, which allows to study um, conformal field theories. And, uh, and uh, let me make some little bit controversial statement. Um, well, it's not convert controversial statement, but maybe it's semantics. I would also uh, put here the these the, the the fundamental things like C theorem, A theorem, tooth anomalies, tooth anomaly matching, into bootstrap methods. Very good. So um, basically, in the rest of the talk, I will, I will, of today, and maybe the beginning of tomorrow, I would like to talk about the S matrix bootstrap and recent developments. 
and uh, maybe in the end of tomorrow, I will uh, I will have time to talk about the numerical from Bootstrap very briefly. But before I start that, I would like to show you just some results, some 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 very concrete results. What you can do uh, with numerical methods before I, I jump into Bootstrap results. So, and I will show the case of two dimensions. I will take lambda phi to the fourth theory, which is, well, let me write it again. My. Okay, so my UV Lagrangian, so this is the, uh, the, the, my QFT, uh, which is defined through the uh, UV degrees of freedom. I have two parameters, M0 and, uh, and lambda bar. So for simplicity, uh, let, me, let me, well, we can always set M0 to one. And uh, lambda bar is my free parameter. And what I would like to compute, you know, this particular model compute, are the scattery amplitudes. And in two dimensions, I, I, I said that uh, there are three, uh, the, in the scattery amplitude, there are three variables. One is related to SMT. In two dimensions, is a particular case, so you also don't have T. So the scattery amplitude is a function of one single variable S. And then, what you you could you want to try to compute is the form factor of the stress tensor which i defined you previously and you want to compute the spectral density of the stress tensor i i mentioned before that there are two uh, spectral densities there, there is also this uh, row two but in two dimensions, again, it's a simple, such a simple uh, case that uh, you don't have the second spectral density. So these, are, these three are the simple observables. Okay. Now, with the, with the techniques we have, for example, with Pesky and Schroeder, uh, we can uh, compute uh, these observables in perturbation theory, in uh, perturbation theory. Uh, theory for values of lambda bar much less than one. Right. So this, uh, for instance, the scattering amplitude is the Peskin Schroeder standard result. To my big surprise, I couldn't. Well, we couldn't fi find with, with my collaborators. <laughs> any perturbative answers for the form factor or uh, the, the spectral density. I'm sure that there, well, people computed it the million times in perturbation theory, but uh, it was hard to find any anything in the literature, so it was simpler to recompute them. Now, the arguably phi to the fourth theory in two dimensions is the simple uh, quantum field theory you can think of, and uh, well, one one would like to compute these observables uh, at now at strong coupling. Uh, how we would like how to compute, how to compute. Compute them uh, at uh, lambda of order, order one. So non perturbative regime. Uh, 
And surprisingly, uh, even though all the methods, for instance, lattice methods, there's the, uh, in particular, you can get the spectrum of your theory and use the Lutcher method to, 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 to compute these guys. Uh, and this hasn't been done, at least we, I, I, I'm not familiar with anywhere in the literature this is done. And uh, with uh, my collaborator, Hong Bin Chen uh, and uh, Liam Fitzpatrick, we studied this uh, particular model, phi to the four in 2D, using a combination of Hamiltonian truncation Uh, truncation and bootstrap as matrix bootstrap. Right. And uh, I will not uh, have time to talk about this work and I will not talk about it, but I will just show you the result. Uh, Uh, can can you can you see the paper now? The, the the two plots on the screen. Yeah, I think everyone can see. Uh, excellent. So here, uh, T tau is the interacting part, acting uh, part uh, of the scattering amplitude. And here we plot the real part versus the imaginary part. Okay. M is the physical mass. Uh, is the physical mass. And uh, M is, uh, is some. It, is some function you can write it you, you can write and find the numerical function in terms of your bare mass m0 so this uh, m is the real mass of the of the particle now these curves on this plot represent the, the real part of the interacting part of the sketchy amplitude in different colors they are uh, they represent different uh, different values of lambda bar What you can see here, so basically lambda bar, uh, we start with uh, with uh, lambda bar equal to one, and then we go all the way to lambda 18. Right, and here are the different colors. Uh, it turns out that lambda bar equal to one is, is still a perturbative regime, and uh, the non-perturbative regime uh, in, 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 in our notation starts at around uh, four pi squared. Well, it starts below four pi squared. Uh, yeah. So for instance, this is the roughly uh, lambda by 10 is a full non-perturbative regime. The higher in, uh, in lambda bar you go, the more difficult it is to compute things, even non-perturbatively. And you see, for instance, lambda bar equal to 18, uh, the, the line is, uh, is wiggly. Uh, starts to get wiggly, but uh, it's it's remarkable. Ah, yeah, and uh, lambda bar, I don't remember exactly. I think it's around uh, twenty three, uh, something like this, or twenty two. Is is what happens? Is a critical value of lambda bar when in IR, you get the two D Ising model. Two D is Ising model. Right. And uh, so approaching this lambda bar equal to 23 is, is very, very hard. Um, but what you can do theoretically, you can take to the IC model and uh, deform it and compute the scattering amplitude. So this dash line is the uh, analytic prediction.
because you deform the uh, 2D Ising model, you can do some some per perturbative computation around roughly conformal perturbation theory around to the Ising model, and you can get this quantity. And you see the blue line, even though it's wiggly from our methods, it kind of starts resembling what you expect expect analytical. Sorry, Dennis, is this yeah. uh, the free fermion S matrix? Uh, plus some TT bar, or is it something more than that? Uh... Exactly, exactly. So uh, thank you, thank you, Antonio. So to the uh, Ising model, uh, it's, uh, you can say it's dual. Well, it's not dual, it's like has an equivalent description in terms of the free Majorana fermion. And in the vicinity, of the free Majorana fermion, you can, there's a unique deformation, which is TT bar, where T stands for the stress tensor, right? And uh, yeah, free Majorana plus TT bar gives you this uh, dashed line. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, good. So uh, here's, we are in the unbroken phase of the 2D, uh, phi to the four theory. So Z2 is, uh, is, uh, is preserved. So the the uh, the this is sixteen. This is called the elastic regime. And uh, in this regime, in this elastic regime, uh, we can uh, very confidently compute the sketching uh, sketching amplitude. When uh, the energies grow higher than 16, um, I wouldn't trust our results very well. Also, this part is okay. This is okay, this is okay. This is probably not okay. But uh, why, to explain why I need to go into the methods and the details, and I don't wanna do it. I just try to show you some non-perturbative results. And uh, this is the uh, imaginary part of the sketching amplitude. So the thing, same same behavior. The imaginary part uh, starts from the uh, four part, uh, two particle uh, threshold from four m squared. Here's zero, and again the dashed line is the prediction from free Majorana plus T T bar, and we start uh, approaching it very nicely with our Hamiltonian truncation methods. So then, you have a question. Please. One second, there is a bit of noise in the room. So no, my question is. Uh, the, um, the perturbative computation you did this level, the perturbative uh, result, sorry. The perturbative result. Uh, yeah, sorry, no, there is a bit of noise. Pardon, excuse me. No, uh, I, and my question is uh, if the, you computed the, at uh, how many loop for the perturbative result? So, for example, this lambda bar equal to one, I'm saying this is in the perturbative regime. So you can compute things perturbatively, and we just use the, the Peskin and Schroeder formula, basically, which is to one loop. And uh, the result is given by this red dash line. The red dash line is the perturbative result, and the blue line is the Hamilton truncation result. And you see they are very nicely uh, match. Yeah, yeah, I see. So it's one loop. Yeah, well, just one loop is enough. OK, thank you. Sorry for the noise. Mm -hmm. Good. So this is the example. So. Even though all the tools in principle are in the market uh, for computing uh, sketching amplitudes and five to the four theory in 2D, it was, to, to the best of my knowledge, it was, hasn't been done. Uh, if someone knows some, some old results, please let me know. Uh, I'd be happy to compare these plots. Um, This was the sketch amplitude, and let me also show the form factors. Here are the form factors. Again, uh, this is the real part of the form factor, and theta is the stress tensor, it's basically the trace of the stress tensor. Here's the imaginary part of the form factor. And um, yeah. So again, these are various plots for different values of lambda bar. Let me just uh, uh, show you. Uh, uh, theta is t mu mu. 
an interesting thing which uh, comes from the non non perturbative uh, bootstrap like statements that the form factor at very low energies no matter what theory you have it uh, it always asymptotes to minus 2 and uh, I mean, I, I find this uh, this fact uh, very non-trivial and uh, very beautiful. I think it's in, in 2D, it is uh, known, especially people who are doing uh, uh, form factor bootstrap in 2D, but it remains actually true in high dimensions. And uh, there is, one can do a beautiful derivation of it, which uh, comes from the fact that the stress tensor T0 mu in, uh, any number of dimensions, well, d minus in any number of dimensions, it uh, defines me generators of translations. And uh, using this fact and the properties of the translation generators, one can uh, define the property that the form factor of the stress trace of the stress tensor in any dimensions, when you send s goes to zero, is given by minus two m squared where M is the physical mass of the particle. Anyway, sorry, this was, that was just a side comment. These are the example of the, uh, the form factors and, uh, and the spectral density. And let's see. Yeah, uh, it, the spectral density is in the, another paper, but uh, for instance, this is the one given by, uh, this is the spectral density, but for one particular value of uh, lambda, lambda 10. So very non-perturbative regime. Uh, so that's the 16, 16. That's where I trust my results. Yeah, so that's how the spectral density looks like. Can I ask something, Dennis? So is there any abstraction in principle to studying to going all the way to the Z-broken phase or is just a numerics breakdown? Good. So for me, it's hard to answer that question because I'm not an expert in Hamilton truncation. Um, and so the, the big answer would be no, there is no abstraction into going to the broken phase. And I think you can do it. However, uh, in a particular Hamiltonian truncation method, there could be some problems. Basically, my answer is, well, the method we used here, yeah, we probably will have some technical troubles going to the, unbroke, uh, to the broken phase. But you, we are very welcome to take any other Hamiltonian truncation method and uh, combining it with a bootstrap, we can just repeat the procedure and do the broken phase. In fact, in fact, in the broken phase, I think people computed the scattering amplitude in the 5-4 theory uh, using lattice, using Lucher method. So that's what uh, Pedro was complaining about. In the broken phase, this data. I see, I see. So with this, I would like to finish discussing, like showing you particular example, how you can solve non-perturbatively to get some observables in a very particular theory. Probably more data will come in the future, hopefully. And now I will shift gears and talk about the S-matrix bootstrap. And before you, this is the moment to ask questions, basically. Uh, Sure, thank you. Thank you for staying here. Oh, uh, Oi. Okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, let's uh, talk about the S matrix bootstrap.
Very good. So I will be working with uh, general dimensions here in principle. And, uh, and uh, let me be very precise. So the full scattering matrix, the full scattering amplitude, Yeah, uh, no, let, yeah, I don't want to go through these details. Uh, I always wrote that the sketch amplitude S depends on the uh, three Mandelstam variables, S, T, E, and U. Uh, more precisely, what I mean that it's not really the sketch amplitude, but the interacting part of the sketch amplitude. Uh, because uh, when there is a free part, when particle uh, particles just uh, pass through each other and don't interact, uh, there are some delta functions. So it's uh, uh, the scatter amplitude is actually a distribution, but the interacting part, well, it's more or less a function. And um, and sometimes in some plots, I will call it tau, tau. So tau and s might be used interchangeably. Sorry uh, for, for that confusion. But basically, I always want to talk about interacting part of the sketchy amplitude. Excellent. So generically, this object is a non-perturbative object, and uh, it can come from any theory. I a priori, I don't know if, uh, yeah, what what is the theory which gives me this S matrix? If what kind of UV, com UV completion, UV CFT is at high energies, what deformation? A priori, I don't know anything. But there is a class of these functions where S plus T plus U equal to 4M squared. And I would like to somehow say something about these functions. How can I bound them? How can I restrict them? And uh, I will be talking about scalar particles only. However, everything I say here can be generalized lies to particles with uh, general masses. And spins. And uh, this generalization is by no means easy. It's actually, it's quite complicated. Uh, so I, I don't want to diminish it, but uh, it is enough to talk about scalar particles to get the, the con conceptual idea what can happen. And then you can also go to spinning particles and, and there are some results currently derived with spinning particles, but it's by no means easy. Good. So now we would like to somehow say something about the sketchy amplitudes. And uh, one possibility is to define parameters. I'll call them lambda, KL. And these parameters, they will just describe my scattering. Describe, describe my scattering. And uh, I'll define them in the following way. I'll take my scattering amplitude S and I evaluate it at a very particular point when S is equal to T is equal to U equal to four M squared divided by three. All right. And what I also could do before evaluating it, I can take some derivatives in S and in t knl some powers and remember u is not an independent quantity i just uh yeah keep it there uh, because it's nice to keep it and here i'll just this is my definition i divide by kl and i put uh, the physical mass m to the power d minus four plus two k plus l All right, so basically this factor here just stands uh, to make the, 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 the parameter slump dim dimensionless. Uh, 
right? And uh, yeah, basically in, in other ways, if you look at the scattering amplitude, let's say, um, yeah, let's say I, I take the scattering amplitude of S at some fixed T, fixed, uh, and this is the this is the amplitude, and this is the Mandelstam variable S. And here's the point. This is the point four m squared. It's where the uh, the, part, uh, the the two particle states appear. And this four m squared is an unphysical point. And I basically would like to expand my amplitude around this point. And the coefficients lambda, this capital lambda KL, are the coefficients of the daily expansion around the, that point. And right. so basically, these coefficients are needed somehow to characterize my function uh, scattering amplitude. And what I would like to do is to ask the question can I have quantum field theories with Poincare symmetry, which are also unitary? Uh, what kind of values of uh, capital lambda I can have in those theories? Maybe all, all, all lambda are allowed. Maybe not, not all of them. So that is the question. And the bootstrap can answer that for you. Excellent. So what assumptions enter in the S matrix bootstrap? Let's and so uh, assumptions, yeah, assumptions. First assumption is that the scattering amplitude is crossing symmetric. So if you take as STU, you can permute TNS, or you can permute two variables uh, like uh, U, uh, T, S. Right. So crossing symmetry is a very, uh, it's a fundamental property. And in fact, there is no non perturbative proof for any complex values of STU. So there are partial proofs. In, uh, in the S matrix bootstrap, we don't want to address this question and we just take it as an assumption. Uh, we work with QFTs, uh, which with scattering such that the scattering amplitudes are always crossing symmetric. The second assumption is analyticity. Uh, the, the, this, let me say, right, this is crossing symmetry. And here's analyticity. Basically, if you take now, so S for physical, physical values of S variables, they start from 4M squared, they are real, and they, they, they go to infinity. So this is the physical domain. And uh, I think uh, in this case, is T is less or equal to zero. This is my, this is the physical domain. However, in the S matrix bootstrap business, it is very convenient to enlarge the domain of my scattering amplitudes and treat S and T and U variables as complex variables. And then one can look at the complex plane in the S variable and let's uh, keep, keep T to be some value fixed. That what is happening is that in this complex plane, one can show that there is a branch cut starting at four m squared and goes to infinity. In fact, there are many branch cuts. There are also branch cuts starting from nine m squared, etc. There are a bunch of branch cuts, but uh, well, for practical reasons, uh, we don't see them. Uh, yeah, so there's one branch cut. Let's see starting from point squared. And this you can, you can actually sh show. 
uh, uh, very nicely show uh, using unitarity. Here, between because of the crossing symmetry, there is another branch cut, which will start from minus t and go to minus infinity. And by unitarity, what, what else is allowed that you can you might have here some poles in this region. Some poles. Here. Right. That's what we can deduce from unitarity and analyticity uh, and crossing. Oh, sorry. That's analyticity we can deduce from crossing and unitarity. However, in the rest of the complex plane, there could be other branch cuts, other poles. And uh, yeah, in general, we don't know what is happening there. There are some perturbative arguments, semi-perturbative arguments, that uh, if you sketch the lightest particle in your theory, there, there are no more branch cuts on no other poles in the rest of the complex plane. This uh, statement is not proven properly. At least there's no, no accepted proof. And uh, what we will, again, pragmatically use, we will assume that uh, there are these two branch cuts, and maybe some poles here, but there's nothing else. Okay, And this is what I would call assumption of maximal analyticity. So maybe it's not true, but at least uh, for sure there is uh, some class of uh, conformal uh, quantum field theories which have S matrices with this particular property. Finally, uh, the third is unitarity. So unitarity, it basically tells me that if I have a quantum field theory, I have a Hilbert space and uh, there are some states in this Hilbert space. So let me call it the generic, uh, well, unitarity. So in the Hilbert space, I have some states, psi. And the theory is unitary. If we take the inner product of two states and it's non-negative. Okay. Generically, we can, uh, we can if, if we have multiple states, and we do in general, so suppose I have multiple states, I can form the inner product, which, which becomes now a matrix. So unitarity tells me that this matrix should be semi-positive definite. Okay. Uh, let me show you uh, a part. So, good. So these are the three assumptions which go inside the S matrix bootstrap. Uh, I will. What I would like to say now a little bit to develop on unitarity. I will. Uh, I will write you a, a, pre a precise form which is which is useful for any practical computation. In this language, which I wrote here, uh, one can take, so the, this, this seems a very abstract language, but uh, one can make it practical if you do the following. Take two particle states in state and uh, two particle state, which is out state. Okay. So uh, when, when we have a system of two particles, they could be relative angular momentum between particles, like very loosely speaking. So what you would actually wanna do is to project the states into states with definite uh, representation, re sorry, irreducible representation of the little group. And so suppose I did this projection and this gives me L, uh, the spin. Uh, little group spin, which can be zero, uh, one, two, three, etc., up to infinity. Because 
uh, my two particle states, I, 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 I for simplicity, I want to talk about. Um, identical particles. So you're not allowed to have odd spins in this uh, decomposition. So you have only uh, zero, two, four, etc. These are just the statements. This this can be done very concretely, and I can refer you to some some papers where where this is done. Very good. So in and out state, and you can also consider here. Uh, two particle in state with some uh, projection onto definite spin and two particle state out project to definite spin. Excellent. So now, as I told you, this matrix, if I take in the products of these guys, there are four entries. And uh, this matrix, no matter what I get, should be semi-positive definite. Let's see what entries we have. When we take two particle state in and two particle state out, uh, uh, sorry, two particle in with two particle in state. So these guys, they live in the same Hilbert space. This is basically the same state. And uh, the inner product is some constant. And uh, the normalizations are normally chosen in such a way that this is simply one. When, when we take an inner product of out state without state, it's the same thing. It's just uh, some constant. However, when we take the in particle state, the inner product without particle state to particle state, we get the scattery amplitude. And when we do the projection to different spin, we get the partial amplitude or partial wave. This partial amplitude will depend on the spin L on the projection and one Mandelstam variable S. And here will be the same thing, just the complex conjugate. Okay, so this matrix should be semi-positive definite. Let me go to the next uh, page and write it uh, properly. The same thing. Basically, the statement that uh, this matrix should be semi positive definite for the physical values of tests because Hilbert space is defined for the physical energies of physical particles. So S for this condition is required to be form squared. It cannot be complex or negative. Now, these quantities here are called the partial amplitudes or partial waves. Partial amplitudes. And um, and uh, and they are defined so in the following way, very precisely. So when you do the projection from when you do the group theory analysis, you you you, you will see what happens. And I, I can again refer you to the precise derivation how all the steps are done. But in the end, what you get is one plus. Uh, I don't remember exactly the factor. It will be I, something like this, square root of S, S minus 4, M squared. Uh, I think it's something like this, D minus 3 or 3 minus D over 2. I don't remember precisely this factor, but it's not very important. The important thing is the integral. Minus 1 to plus 1, uh, D, uh, DX. Here are the Legendre polynomials of x. And here is the interacting part of the scattering amplitude, s, t, and u. Good. So the Legendre polynomials, uh, well, are no one functions. And s, uh, the x is the cosine theta, where theta is the scattering angle.
So basically, when you scatter two particles, suppose they aligned along some axis, some z axis, and then uh, this is the in, and then we get uh, outcoming states, outgoing, out, out. This is the scattering angle theta. And the finally, the Mandelstam variables s they depend on on ah sorry s does not depend on anything it's just the energy but uh, the Mandelstam variables t are some functions of s and x uh, s and x i i can give you the precise uh, uh relation if you're interested but it's a standard textbook uh, formula anyway so you, you see what happens. You take the scattering amplitude and you have uh, three variables, S, T, and U. T and U depend on S and X. So you can just do the change of variables. Then you integrate with a scattering angle uh, with the Lejeune polynomials. And this Lejeune polynomials integration gives you the projection to the partial, partial waves. And uh, the, the very final uh, unitarity constraint then becomes this quantity. What does it mean uh, semi-definite positive? It means that all the eigenvalues of this matrix should be non-negative. There is another, there's a criteria called the Sylvester criteria, Sylvester's criterion which says that the matrix is semi-positive definite if and only if all its principal minors are non-negative. And if we look at uh, the, the principal minors are this and this, so they're clearly non-negative. And uh, the final principal minor is the determinant of this matrix. So if we take the determinant of this matrix, it will be minus one minus the partial amplitude squared greater than zero. So you, you see, we arrive to the standard constraint. Less than one. This is the textbook formula. OK, so um, this, this con constraint, the unitarity constraint written in this form, and crossing and analyticity here, crossing and analyticity here is the foundation of the scattering matrix bootstrap. There are various tools, analytic numerical tools, which use these fundamental concepts to put bounds on, on the observables, lambda capital lambda KL defined th this way. So you can bound. And uh, I will discuss, I guess, these tools tomorrow. What I would, will show you, for example, just like uh, give you uh, some taste uh, for what kind of bounds we can have. So this is the, the, the plot, for example. Um, This uh, two observables, lambda zero zero, lambda two zero, which I define you. And uh, this is the bound given by this blue line. Everything inside, uh, everything is inside, is allowed, is allowed. However, if you step outside of this island, this point, no matter what QFT you try to construct, this point will never be consistent with the assumption of crossing unitarity and analyticity. So no matter what theory you construct, uh, phi to the four, ah, this is in, in four dimensions, d equal to four. Whatever theory you can think of, which has particle description and has asymptotic states, will live inside this island. Okay, And uh, to obtain this uh, uh, blue uh, line, that's what the method I will talk tomorrow about, is the numerical um, 
as Mary was trap method pioneered by Joao Pinedonis, uh, Pedro Vieira, Balt, and uh, Miguel. Right. And, um, and here's another plot in a similar spirit. Sorry. Here's another plot. This now I'm, I'm bounding lambda to zero versus lambda to one. This island is the allowed region where things uh, that on any theory you can think of, which is consistent with all my assumptions should live inside this island. Disregard this uh, and max values. It's like a preliminary prot. Basically, they the allowed values should live inside the island. The dash lines here and here, they are uh, exact but non-optimal bounds, which come from dispersion relations. Which I will discuss tomorrow. This is another non-perturbative asymmetric bootstrap uh, tool. So these dash lines, one could have derived them in principle many years ago. Now with, with numerical tools, with aid of some, some numerical tools, it's becoming simpler. But basically dispersion relation tell you that anything inside this cone is allowed. And the modern approach, non-perturbative approach, uh, gives you this island instead. So it's much stronger. But a uh, nice thing that uh, these two approaches, they, they match very well uh in uh for small values of parameters this is like semi-perturbative regime so th this uh, these are new results they're they're still unpublished uh, so i cannot refer you to them for now very good um so let, let me address the question do you mean that uh, there are no UV complete QFTs outside this island? Yes, uh, you can say it this way. Um, okay, so. This, uh, this is a very tricky question about UV complete uh, quantum field theories. For what I mean right now, I'm just saying, suppose I have a scattering amplitude, which is valid at any energy scale, including the very high energies. And uh, at low energies, well, at it, it is true at any energy scale, and it is unitary at any energy scale, is analytic, maximal analytic, and unitary. Then, if my, I have some UV QFT which gives me such an S matrix, then such an S matrix should live inside this island. So, yes, that's what I mean. However, S matrix is a little bit more general than what I'm saying. For instance, you have an S matrix and in the UV, it has a different UV completion. It's not necessarily some CFT, but it can be some string theory. These bounds apply also to the, those scenarios. Right. The problem why I'm saying it's a tricky question is because the S matrix bootstrap, uh, or like scattering amplitude, even though it is defined at energy, any energy scale, even going to very high energy scales, is uh, is not really sensitive to the precise definition of the UV CFT or string theory or its deformation. Okay, but anyway, yeah, roughly speaking, that's what I mean. But uh, that this bound is generic; it's also applicable to string theory, etc. Let's see the other question: What if it is confined at low energies? So uh, when I talk about the scattering matrix, scattering techniques, I assume that I have particles. So I have a energy gap particles and below the particle energy scale, below the particle mass, there's nothing. So there's vacuum, then nothing, 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 then particle, and then things start happening. Then I have scattering of particles. So 
in a sense, you need a con yeah, the theory can be confined. You can have in the UV some some QCD, it confines, and at low energies it will produce me glue balls, uh, uh, glue balls, uh, uh, protons, etc. And those will be your particles which you scatter. So it's okay. Maybe you're asking if I take QCD with no mass, then I have my pions become goldstone bosons and they're massless. So there's no mass, uh, so there's no mass gap. Those cases are still can be treated by the S matrix bootstrap, but they are more tricky. Uh, generically, massless particles, the scattering amplitude of massless particles is not well defined. For example, you cannot define a scattering amplitude of gravitons in four dimensions, non perturbatively. But you can define the scattering amplitude of photons or uh, pions, massless pions in 4D. But this is a tricky question. Again, massless particles should be treated separately and very carefully. Good. So these are the plots. It's like uh, I just give you the taste of uh, what you can do. And I will talk about uh, how we can obtain these plots uh, tomorrow. Uh, to, I will conclude now with uh, one extra theoretical detail. So here I assumed that, so I showed you how to derive unitarity constraints uh, on the scattering amplitudes using uh, this fundamental property that uh, the Hilbert space, uh, should, all the states should be semi uh, um, all the inner product should be uh, non-negative or semi-positive definite. And, but I derive you some known result, uh, which is a textbook formula. Uh, let me explain you why this way of thinking is, uh, is very powerful. Suppose now, and, and here will be the last thing I will talk about today. Suppose now I will take, as before, two particle in state, projected to some spin L, two particle state out, projected to some spin L. And then let me take the stress tensor, T mu nu of X, and I act on the vacuum. So I would like then Fourier transform this state D for X, and here put I P dot X. So basically, these are my three states. And I would like to take the inner product with the same uh, three states, 2, 2, P, P, S, L, in, two particle state, out. And again, the, this third state, let me just call it Psi. I don't want to rewrite it here again. So the state Psi. Now, this is the three by three matrix. And uh, by the arguments before, it should be semi-positive definite. Now let's take a look at this matrix in detail. What, uh, what entries do we have? So this two by two matrix here is as before. It's just a constant constant. Uh, here I will have SL, the partial amplitude. Uh, and here is the conjugate partial amplitude. So this is as, as before. But now, uh, look, if I take the, the precise derivation of all these entries can be found in one of my papers. Again, I can give all the references after the talk. Here, I'll, I'll skip the details, but I just uh, tell you the end result. If you remember, uh, I define the form factor as the two particle state together with the local operator T acting on the vacuum. So, and I call this the form factor. So this is the form factor of T. Uh, this will be the form factor of T conjugate. And uh, the, these entries, they will be exactly the same as this one, but conjugated. So I'm, I'm not deriving it, but I'm telling you uh, very roughly, you, you see where, where it's coming from, because uh, uh, I take uh, here the, the 
vacuum stress tensor with a two particle state it's got to be the form factor but the, the precise details the kinematic uh, numbers here yeah you have to compute them uh, which i don't want to do here all right so these are my form factors and again this stress tensor carries lorentz indices and I have to be careful about uh, doing proper group theory, decomposing things into uh, a little group indices. Let me just ignore it. I want to be completely schematic. And here, what I have is the stress tensor. Here will be the stress tensor and the vacuum. So I have the two point function of the stress tensor. When I do the Fourier transforms, I'll get the spectral density of the stress tensor. So here's the statement. Now, using uh, the fundamental definition of unitarity, you can say that the three by three matrix, which contains sketchy amplitudes, form factors, and spectral density, and the spectral density of the stress tensor, should be semi positive definite. And this is true for any S uh, greater or equal than, than, than zero. And this unitarity condition provides you further uh, interest in mixing between the three observables. And it provides you to using S matrix bootstrap techniques, like so using some numerical techniques, not only bound scattering amplitudes, but also bound form factors and spectral densities in the same uh, manner. So this unitarity constraint it basically gives you a way to generalize the standard S matrix bootstrap techniques to the form factor bootstrap and spectral density bootstrap. Uh, in, in principle in general dimensions. And uh, why these observables are nice? Well, because these spectral densities, for example, as I as I, I, I tried to mention in one of the questions, in one of the answers I gave to the questions, that sketching amplitudes, they don't know precisely anything about sketching amplitudes, they don't know much about the precise realization of your UV fixed point about the CFT and the deformation, even though it, it is true, the scattering amplitude is true to all the energies. However, the spectral density is the two point function, and it does know about UV and IR CFT. So, for instance, this thing is sensitive to, to the CUV central charge and CIR central charge, which are CFT quantities. And this unitarity provides you mixing between some CFT data. And the asymmetric bootstrap data. So I'll stop here. Let's uh, let's stop, and I'll address questions now. How are we allowed to just pick and choose which states we put in this matrix? Thanks. Good. Uh, so um, we are allowed to pick any any states you want. Uh, right. So anything you want. It just. Uh, the way I construct this uh, this matrix, I pick some very particular states which are useful, which are easy to work with. And and what are the criteria for easy to work with? So I have my Hilbert space. This on the Hilbert space, I have my little group. So first thing I would like to work with any state which is transforms in their irreducible representation of my uh, little group. So that's why I big projections here okay and i will have also to project this these guys now two particle states are the natural objects to define sketch amplitude so i pick them and the last option i have is just to take a vacuum and if i want to inject somehow in the setup some information about local operators well i'll take a vacuum and i act with some uh, some some operator and the most uh, universal operator you can think of is the stress tensor yeah so that's how you construct how you pick states the most generic and interesting quantities and they such that they transform in the reducible representation of the little group yeah. All right. Uh, yes, exactly. There's uh, no problem whatsoever. 
you you can put as many states as you want in practice for example you can um, here i assume that uh, you have uh, two particle states of the same mass uh, but you can for instance consider uh, two particle states of different masses if you have more complicated theory m1 m2 and uh, mix them with all possibilities m1 and one m2 m2 uh, and you might actually what you would like to do is to go to three particle states three particle states or four particle states you can consider uh, instead of one operator uh, acting on the vacuum you can consider two operators acting on the vacuum etc however when you do the matrix like that uh, the the observables in size will be a very complicated things for instance scattering of two to three or two to four particles or form factors with multi particles or instead of two particles the two point function you'll get a four point function here and working with these objects in practice is just very complicated so it's uh, basically in, in two dimensions i think this is an interesting direction and this should be done uh, consider high particle states for instance but going in high dimensions to high particle states oof, it's a nightmare yeah so you can add whatever you want but you should still be reasonable what you add because you want to do something in practice with these matrices This uh, partic uh, semi-positive definiteness, it's there only for S greater than or equal to 4M square, right? For this matrix. Exactly. Because my states, they define in the Hilbert space. And this Hilbert space um, describes, uh, yeah, my physical quantum field theory. And all these states, they are given for real values, real and physical values of particles. Yeah, so for those real and physical values s is always greater than 4m squared uh, so to 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 have uh, to relate this with cir you need to take s to zero don't you have to do that s to zero exactly you to relate to ir you have to take s to zero exactly um so the point is this unitarity constraint is true only for s greater than 4m squared now but this function rho t of s is defined uh, for s for for any values of s so there, there are two, two subtleties so for, for, for example yeah uh, so in in your question there are there, there, there are two subtleties uh, forget about uh, rho t of s i think take the scattering amplitude S L of S, okay? This guy is defined, it can be defined for, I think for, yeah, it can be defined for complex values of S, not even real can be defined for complex values of S. What I'm just saying that the unitarity constraint of this matrix will constrain on the, the real part of this function starting from S, starting from form squared. Okay. Yeah. And another subtlety is that uh, we have a mass gap. In this setup, I assume the mass gap. So in the IR, my CFT is free. There's nothing there. So CIR in this uh, in this particular setup I'm talking about will be zero. But this rho T of S will still be sensitive to CUV. And in fact, you can uh, put bounds on central charge in UV in two dimensions as a function of some parameters which describe the sketching amplitude here. Okay. okay. And yeah, this is another work I can refer you to and to show you particular bounds if you're interested. Um, okay. Um, can I just uh, say that I'm happy to talk either now, you can also text me or email me offline i'm very happy to talk if you're interested in details we can just don't be shy text me if you're interested thanks so dennis i have also a question actually uh yeah maybe it's naive but i wanted to ask you are those lambda kl defining the s matrix uniquely like or because I, my understanding is that they define uh, the two scattering uniquely right 
Uh, it's a very good question, which um, which um, yeah, yeah, let me try to address it. So this lambda KL, they're defined through the scattering matrix, which is two, 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 two. Right. So if you want to describe, if you want to consider two to three or two to four scattering amplitude, these lambdas will have in principle nothing to do with it. Yeah. Though, however, of course, if you have some, some theory from that, in that theory, you will compute two to two and two to four. You can compute anything. So somehow they'll be related between each other, various sketching amplitudes. But, uh, but from this point of view, no, the lambda KL will only describe two to two. Now the question, will they, the, the, the main question, will they describe uniquely the sketching amplitude? And I think the answer is yes. And the reason for that is the following. So if I look now at the complex plane uh, S and I look at the sketchy amplitude at uh, T fixed, I have a branch cut here starting from two M squared and uh, here at minus T. Uh, right, and four uh, M squared will be somewhere here, four M squared divided by three. This is the point I'm expanding around. So basically this lambda KL, they give me a Taylor expansion coefficient around this point. But uh, very roughly say, uh, saying that, uh, speaking, the, the function, uh, the sketch amplitude is analytic in the whole complex plane. So you can keep expanding, uh, again, expanding, expanding uh, yeah. uh, the function because it's analytic, because it's nice. But in practice, uh, um, if you want to probe some uh, inelastic properties at very high energies of the sketchy amplitudes, probably these observables, they will not be very sensitive to those, uh, to those effects. Yeah, you need to go very high K, I think. Right, but in practice, if you, you, exactly. But uh, even if you go to very high K, uh, I don't know if you do some numerical studies. I'm not sure how how well they will be, how sensitive they will be to those effects. Maybe one have to define some new lambdas uh, at, at this point, right above uh, right above the branch cut. But uh, I mean, this is like beyond of anything people do or can do. Yeah, yeah, I, I see. So you're saying that um... you're very welcome. I'm, I'm glad you liked it. I don't think. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're saying that no clue about more uh, more particles in the final state, right? That you have to define a new lambda KL, at least in principle. I understand this. Right. If if you wanna, you you mean two to three scattering? You want? No, I, I was thinking because I mean in the usual theory we have, as we're saying, we write an interaction term that is providing uh, all possible interaction for many different scattering. But uh, in this line of principle, this is not guaranteed at all. So this lambda KL, it, they hold only for, is an uh, description that uh, is holding only for two to two. And uh, this is my, my understanding. Yes. Yeah, I, I think you have to do extra assumption to talk about more uh, scattering amplitudes, right? Uh, right. The thing is, I, I'm very scared to talk about different scattering amplitudes, like two to three or two to four, because the number of maldus time invariants Grows, grows crazily. I think two to three should be six Mendel's time variables. Mm. They, and they will be reduced to five probably because some of some relation. This is just insane. Uh, and uh, for now with modern understanding of modern techniques, it seems uh, unfeasible. Mm. Though the, I've heard there are some papers that, that uh, Mendel's time discussed the analytic properties of higher point amplitude. So yeah. But it's it's very difficult just for the sheer complexity of the object. I see. I see. Okay. No, thank you. Oh, I think that if there are no other questions, we should stop here because it's uh, more or less the time we said we would stop. Right. So, please, yeah. anyone who's interested, uh, email me or call me. Yeah, exactly. If there are more, you can. Uh, yeah, you can text Dennis. And mm -hmm. He will be happy to discuss. So, so Dennis, thank you. Sorry. 
Uh, see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Yeah, this is what I was saying. I wanted to thank you for the lecture. It was great. I liked it a lot. And I think also people in the audience liked it. And we can meet tomorrow at the same time and uh, continuing on this series with the same format. So yeah, let's meet tomorrow, more or less, yeah, at the same time. And we can go ahead with that. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Dennis. Thank you, everyone. And have a great day.